thank you for coming back. I hope you're all refreshed. Coffee, tea. Um, we're moving on from the notion of education that had a large degree of idealism to something that is probably more realistic now, where we talk about work, labor. We talk about economy and we talk about exchange because we all know that design is not just esoteric ideas that gives us a warm and fuzzy feeling, but we also need to be able to acknowledge that it's within a commodity exchange system. So my pleasure is to introduce uh, three speakers, two of whom work with um, trade organization, if that's the right word, with uh, public organizations that support uh, the link between design activities and industry, and uh, the, uh, one of whom uh, is Christina Malanda, who is the program director for the Dench Design Center, and whose one or one of her responsibility is the Dench Design Center's strategic platform design dimensions. So extension, you can already see the, the idea of the interface. And the other speaker, and they are presenting together, is Henrik Weiglin, who is the CEO of Design Denmark, which is a relatively new trade organization, 2014 or, yeah, yeah 2014. And he funds, or his organization funds events like the new Danish modem at Aarhus, the present European capital of culture, the Danish Design Festival, and also the Danish Design Award. And they will present together. So in the, um, in the way in which Jesper has said, Danish is to do things together. I like that. It's very suggestive. But um, <laughs> so, so clearly they are presenting together. And then I have Rama, um, uh, Rama Shoprash, who is uh, Koprash, sorry. I knew I was going to get that wrong. Who is the uh, head of uh, industrial design, the MFA in industrial design and associate professor of product design. And his interest is also the bringing together of education, which we heard before, to the application to industry. So I look forward to the discussion that ensues. And please, Christina and Henrik. Can I give you Thank you. Can it be there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. Last but not least, a dance between Henrik and I. So, <laughs> always seen. So, it, it is such a pleasure to be here. So, forces at work, uh, how do public and private design institutions uh, stimulate and challenge the field of design? So, I believe the, the key word to our short speak here around forces is w at work is joint forces. Um, I, as mentioned in the introduction, represent the Danish Design Center. It has been mentioned uh, a couple of times before. We are a government-funded, non-profit organization. We are located under the Ministry of Business, and uh, our key mission is to increase the use of of design. Is it that okay? Of design. <laughs> I'm, I'm too short, <laughs> and I feel like uh, this is my time now to be the president. Speak now. Uh, <laughs> no, and it's our job to increase the use of design-driven innovation to Danish businesses. We as the Design Center has developed quite a bit over the last uh, two years, I would say. Today, we do not only bridge uh, the gap uh, between design and, and businesses, um, but we spend most of our time uh, actually creating experiments and prototype together with businesses and designers on creating a new, thank you, <laughs> on creating a new business models. You could say it a little black and white because we have put ourselves together in, in an equation that in this equation, we, the Danes Design Center, we rep represent the demand side to design and representing the demand side, we are extremely dependent on having a good supply of design, why we almost in every project we do today, partner up with Design Denmark. That was my key word. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, Design Denmark is, uh, is an alliance uh, privately funded of, uh, of design thinkers, doers, and users. And as you can, can almost see from this figure, we are, we are meeting uh, the demand that, uh, that the Danish Design Center hopefully creates out in, in, in other businesses. 
So that's primarily our, our target, working to promote uh, design uh, in, in other businesses and in society in, in general. But joint forces. Let me just add, because <laughs> Ulrich was mentioning that we were a rather uh, new uh, organization. We're actually a merger of two former organizations, so our history uh, goes uh, back, and it was, was uh, what was uh, Jesper and, and, and Tim was talking about uh, a bit earlier, that, that we wanted to create the, the synergy in the Danish uh, design field, uh, so, so we, uh, we merged two former organizations into uh, to Design Denmark. Okay, of speaking of joint forces, <laughs> we are not, not only two partners in this. This you can't read, uh, but I, I want to elaborate a little more about the joint forces. So we brought this slide uh, to give you an impression of the Danish design ecosystem um, that is represented by many, many different types of institutions. But all of them have one thing in common, they play a very important role in stimulating the field of design. Uh, the ecosystem is, of course, represented by design education. Uh, we heard from, from two of our amazing deans today. Uh, by political bodies like the Ministry of Business, because they, as a ministry, support business support and, uh, sorry, design support and design promotion in Denmark. It also contains uh, design promotion institutions, knowledge institutions like Design Museum Denmark, uh, Nigolina, head of communication, is also here with us today. She spoke earlier. And also in the ecosystem is the Confederation of Danish Industries. This is the biggest membership organization of Danish businesses. You could say they represent all the users of design. And uh, they have actually, for the last more than maybe, um, yeah, close to 15 years, had a design committee within the organization who is represented by CEO of, design, of companies, and they work together to push the policy agenda for design. And also, the Confederation is actually co-hosting the Danish Design Award. So, just to, uh, to, mention, uh, to mention few. So, I would also add, however, what is new to this in the ecosystem is it, this has developed quite a bit over the last 15 to 10 years. I would say to the Danish people, if you can't find yourself in the system, these are examples, so it's <laughs> <laughs> so important. <laughs> and there is no right, you know, uh, position of where you are, so it's, and it's not better to be on top or on bottom. Nothing <laughs> goes around. No, <laughs> but, 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 but I would say it, it has expanded quite a bit. So, so, of course, the design schools, but there's also the Copenhagen <laughs> Business School, because like here in the US, uh, design is now on the curriculum uh, in the business schools. Um, and also, um, design is more and more recognized in, um, as a driver for, for innovation in our public funds, like the National uh, Innovation Fund and also the Danish Development Fund, which is, uh, which is very great. Further, what is new? Again, my keyword, the joint forces. There is a common sense of urgency to join forces in Denmark, probably abroad in every country, uh, to increase collaboration. And uh, in Denmark, indeed, we work together based on a new common narrative that goes about not ju just what design is, but what design can do. And um, many of us, uh, like all the Danish institutions that are here in New York, uh, we are super, super connected. And we have a deep, deep, deep understanding that we need to work together to, to drive change. And I also think that we need to be good examples if, because if we look at the grand challenges today, they can't be solved by a single company or a single designer, can't be solved by a public institution or private. Collaboration is key. Yeah. So uh, now that you know uh, all of the Danish uh, design ecosystem, we can uh, give you a, a few examples on, on how we, uh, we actually do it in, 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 in everyday life. Um, joint forces is the, is the key word. Uh, we created the, the Danish design forum, and the, this forum is, um, is uh, uh, 30 plus of the leading uh, design institutions uh, in Denmark. The, uh, CEOs, the directors, the deans of the different schools, uh, Danish Design Center, Design Denmark, uh, Design Museum Denmark, 
Uh, we have the Danish Design Council and, and lots of other institutions, but also uh, uh, business organizations uh, participating there. And um, we do that to, uh, again, uh, create the synergy and uh, try to, uh, to, uh, to quote your, your former president, uh, Obama, punch uh, above our, our weight as a design sector, uh, but really get, getting, a, getting a, a voice out there to, to businesses. Uh, we know that, um, that uh, from the, the Danish uh, companies and businesses that, that uses design as a strate strategic uh, method, 90% of them uh, says that it has a direct positive effect on their um, top line and their bottom line. The problem is that it's only 13% 13, 13 <laughs> of the Danish companies that actually uses design as a strategic uh, um, um, what? tool. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so we have a big task there to, uh, to, to actually uh, uh, raise the, the level of knowledge on, on what design thinking can do. So in Design Forum, we are coordinating uh, initiatives. Uh, we are uh, discussing and creating design policies and uh, policies for, uh, for the creative uh, businesses and uh, in general just uh, aligning our positions uh, within the design field. So talking a little bit about our role uh, to policy, this is maybe a very simple model, but uh, not least important. Uh, one of our most uh, important common missions is to push the agenda for design, not just as being an industry in itself, like the food industry, the energy industry, and so forth, but to increase the understanding of design as an enabler to growth that goes across uh, all sorts of industries. Um, I would also say that we absolutely recognize design as an industry in itself but we believe that the potential where design really adds the value is when design is understood as an enabler and not just related to products and lifestyle. Um, I, I think there is an increasing um, understanding of this in our political system, even though, as Elizabeth has mentioned, we don't put enough money into design. I absolutely agree. Uh, but I would say that, um, and most of our policy still is, is built around design being as an seen as an industry, but um, also being the optimist that I am, I think uh, this is definitely changing. And this is also, again, why we joined the forces, so we can speak out louder, because we, we speak louder together. Another example of um, what we've been uh, doing together, uh, Design Denmark and, uh, and the Danish Design Center is uh, yeah, to translate it a plus uh, program. Um, it's been done with, uh, together with, uh, with the, the Danish uh, Industry Association and uh, uh, the Danish Technology University, Te D2. Technical uh, University. Technical University. And, uh, as you can see, it was to mature Danish uh, businesses and design agencies' ab ability to collaborate. And what we actually did there was uh, start in a very small scale with uh, eight uh, concrete uh, corporations where we forced uh, design agencies and businesses to work together on an innovation challenge or uh, some, some uh, problem that was, was out there in the business. and. Um, gathered all the, the learnings from, from these eight projects, uh, went up uh, a bit, did uh, a, a program with 16 um, concrete uh, projects um, and gathered the learning from there. And, uh, and now we are, we are looking at, uh, at 1,000. We're scaling up to, to 1,000 uh, concrete uh, uh, meetings, uh, hopefully with, uh, with design agencies and, and businesses. And this is funded by the the Market Development Fund, the Danish Market De Development Fund, and it is, uh, it, it's all part of uh, getting the, the design uh, thinking and this design knowledge out in, in the Danish businesses. Yep. So, just going to give you a very brief, we've been discussing the Danish Design Award uh, earlier, so, uh, but it's also a, a joint uh, ownership and, and creation of the Danish uh, Design Award. Um, we already heard it from, from Jesper and Tim uh, earlier, uh, that it's, uh, it's about uh, the love of uh, what design can do. It's about the, the sharing of, uh, 
and celebration of, of, the, of the effect or the difference design can make. What is important here is that that is not just an, an award, it's a, it's a movement, it's a campaign, it's an, an ongoing uh, framework for communicating uh, design thinking and design methods and, uh, and, uh, and the projects uh, in, in the award. But I'm not gonna speak uh, a lot about it because we already heard. So another project that is about joint forces, uh, the Danish Design DNA project, that is a collaboration between the Danish Design Council there are many council centers, institutions <laughs> in Denmark, but um, I guess it's positive. The Danish Design Council <laughs> is a national impartial think tank uh, on design, and uh, our deans, at least here, is, is on board. And it's also uh, with the Coe de Co, the design school, the design museum, and DDC. And over the last uh, one and one and a half year, we have been uh, exploring uh, to what extent we can still talk about a certain Danish design DNA. Uh, because uh, we believe in de design in Denmark, it, it is so embedded uh, in, in many ways. I think we, c we are allowed to call ourselves a design society, and when things get so embedded, you also start to taking it for granted. So it was this uh, uh, thing about taking it for granted that we feel together that we needed to, to explore and to rediscover our design DNA. It's extremely important to, to to increase our design identity, understand how we do design and what we are good at and the way we do it. Uh, but also we want to, of course, again, support all our design-driven companies when they go do uh, businesses uh, globally. Okay. And I will not discuss the values because then we open up an interesting discussion. <laughs> so. The last example is uh, the, Danish design of it, the, the Danish Design Festival which we uh, have been, uh, been creating. Uh, a lot of the institutions and uh, together with the Copenhagen and, and Kolding uh, municipality. Um, it's an uh, open alliance welcoming everybody uh, to participate in, in uh, again, sharing uh, what the design is in, in uh, 2018, 19, 20. Um, it celebrates uh, the diversity in, uh, in design and craft through these, uh, these activities. And um, we, uh, we have created a, a platform that will uh, elevate um, design thinking and making it uh, more accessible to other uh, professions. So um, it could be social design, uh, service design, uh, um, a lot of all these uh, different uh, act, uh, design uh, sectors, tech, digital, uh, icons, and new experimental craft. It's all about uh, trying and getting it, it out there. So I guess this is uh, the words uh, yeah. uh, from us uh, for now. Brief. <laughs> yep. Um, we were discussing earlier when we uploaded our slides, that, uh, and I think each session had this, like, oh, I would have done a completely different set of slides had I seen, but each person was saying it to each other. So we're all in the same boat together. Um, I think what's exciting about what we're presenting and we're looking at institutions, we're looking at design itself as a practice and we're looking at education and society is it is a bit like a salad dressing. So um, we're going to go from, uh, I'll give myself vinegar, you can be oil. Um, <laughs> and we'll jump straight in here. So this is a, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to go back to the prompt for this, which is how do public and private design institutions stimulate and challenge design practice today? And I think stimulate and challenge are key words I'm going to look at. This is an image from MoMA's site. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the $5 uh, work that came after the machine show. Um, a close tie-in with industry looking at um, uh, consumer houseware in the United States and what we value as good design, but also a close tie into industry as well. Uh, and MoMA has had a long history of doing this, and it went on, this was I think 1938, it went on to the $10 as the economy rose up. Um, if you look at this work, uh, and then it became good design later on, um, it can't be ignored if you look at the rise of Danish design. It's actually very tied to the good design. If you look at it, there's a lot of teak furniture there. Um, and, 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 and that's really the canonization of the world through this major vehicle. So it's a global vehicle and an important one. Um, I've had the, uh, the, the luck, the talent to be in MoMA at a, at a number of points in my own career. Um, and there was a call 
uh, for a design destination show. Um, I think the, the last one was, uh, it was Destination New York. There was a, uh, and it was a sort of Mo MoMA bringing it to their store, and then it's also exhibited in the museum. So this, in a sense, is a callback to that, that kind of canonization connecting to commerce and to the role of the museum. But it's not officially a show in MoMA, but at the same time, it's actually in the museum and they sell it in the store. And they had design destination uh, Mexico. I think they had design destination Japan. And they had a uh, design destination Denmark. Um, so there's a, the Danish are very excited about that. And there's, they, they, they hand selected the best of the world and it was represented by 10 of the greatest design nations on the planet. And, New York was a nation on its own. Um, and they had this open call, and it was for New York designers to have produced things in the United States. And it was really for first time production to be shown in the store. Now, um, I'm a director of an MFA industrial design. I also have a small practice. Um, I work on pretty large scale projects and small ones. But to self produce a product um, as an industrial designer without a company and put it in a store, for those of you that are involved, is a, is a very large venture. Um, and I called some friends of mine who have work in the store, and I said, so how do you do it? And they go, oh, I almost went bankrupt on my last project at the <laughs> MoMA store. And so there's this, uh, even to enter the competition, I said, okay, I'm going to enter it. So um, I entered the uh, competition, and um, part of my role as a faculty is I used to do very mass production. I would design for, my first work in MoMA was a collection I did for Herman Miller that was in the WorkSphere show, and I've done very large things. As a professor, I do two to six projects a year, which I consider benchmark projects, which help to mark what design could be. Um, and so I decided to design uh, a potato masher for New Yorkers. Um, and the, and I uh, considered it sort of a dumb object because it was something that was so basic, but New Yorkers don't really cook. Um, and this would be a way to re-engage with a lo local war movement. They could go to the, to the I think it's, uh, we're up to 60 or 70 local farmers markets. They could get potatoes and they could mash them. Um, and I thought, and this is sort of an Alessi-like object. And you know that seemed like a good category. I did a lot of different proposals. I spent a couple of months sketching things, um, generated a lot of work to get the right piece. Um, and, and I proposed a few to the uh, museum committee. Um, this is one that I sent in. I gave myself a challenge, though, that was beyond what MoMA had given. They said it needed to be produced in the United States, um, looking at what is local production. And what I saw the role of the institution, a, uh, a canonizing institution of MoMA, of what it could be of, I said, well, what would it mean to produce in New York City for New York City and kickstart manufacturing again, where we're not shipping things, where there's a capacity to, to make. I found the largest industrial spring company in the world, which happened to be in Brooklyn, um, with distribution around the world. And so I produced something that was completely automated in its production, that was uh, passivated in, in citric acid and instead of in hydrochloric acid. I mapped a huge supply chain of how it would be produced and presented this. Um, this is what I ended up with, because um, when I went through that beautiful object, I found that I couldn't produce that in New York City. And I got in this very interesting conversation with the museum, and they loved, they loved this. This was MoMA. Um, I shouldn't say it, but it was, I heard from certain great curators there that this is the kind of thing that we would put in our permanent collection. <laughs> and as a, uh, I was 30 in my first show, um, and that was for me, I like made it as a designer, but decided I would teach and do something else and keep working as a, you know, as a 40 something designer. And I hear this is the kind of thing that like, that's what you want to hear, but I could only produce it in Baltimore. Um, and I found, and I said, well, I don't want to produce that. I can't figure out how to make it in New York. This is what I can give you in New York. And they were the big letdown. Everyone is like, I have colleagues that I taught with, and they're like, you can't, you know, the, the other one's so beautiful. You have to do that, and it's about automation. The reason I could only make this one was they had some CNC equipment, but they did their prototyping mostly by hand. I can name the maker from Puerto Rico who made these and did the first run of them. And it was not an automated activity that I had hoped for, but it was the reality of working in New York City. And uh, I said, so would this be in your, um, permanent collection? And I said, no, no, there's something like this would not be in our permanent collection. And I said, but would it be, um, would it 
would it get in the show? And they said, well, you'll find out, you know, if you propose this, you'll, you'll see. But it's, you know, there wasn't the elation around the room. But there was an excitement for the philosophy behind the work that was being produced. And this, this actually was the manifestation of New York City. It's, it is actually a spring, so it has, it has flexibility to it. it. It is not a monstrous hybrid like an OXO good grips of different materials. Um, it's a very high performance object. It bends around a potato. Um, has a lot of ergonomic issues because it's not the best way to hold it. But this is what I could produce. And indeed, it made it into the show. Um, and it was shown in the museum. This was what was more important to me. And this is really the work. Um, is it became, it, there was an article, there's Paolo Antonelli with the potato masher. This is, this is the Academy Awards. Um, this is even better than the Cooper Hewitt getting in a national triennial. To be in the talk of the town after an article on Hillary Clinton's run for presidency with a potato masher is where you want to be as an industrial designer. Um, and the, uh, the challenge I had as a designer, and I think that's uh, yeah, the last one. The challenge I had as a designer working on this project was this, um, question of what is the role of the museum? Is the role of the museum and the institutions, is it to collect the work that we're doing? Is it to see, to see and to take the best of? Is it to see what, how industry, and they're somehow taking a litmus of it? Or, like MoMA used to do with the $5, $10, is it a charge? Um, and you can see this with the Eames. Like the Eames were working in an apartment um, in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. They were trying to prototype a chair. It makes it into the good design in MoMA. And this starts an entire revolution around manufacturing. I question, especially at this, the canonizing scale, where it can change an entire country's um, flow of tea globally, um, what the role of the institution is. And so, so from my perspective, and I would also say from the Danish Design Center, I would like to see less business um, and, and more idealism in what the role of the museum is and, and providing other pathways. And so that would include things like commissioning, supporting designers with doing FDA approval on something like this, um, paying for that out of their own pocket, um, ensuring it for the general public of New York, um, and, and sort of managing all of that. So that, that for me, that's a question I would like to, and with that, I will invite our moderator back up. <laughs> By the way, no one has ever seen, except for a few faculty, the other, <laughs> the, the design that wasn't produced. Huh? Or even two? Thank you very much. Um, so, questions. Not just from the people who have been doing these internal dialogues between each other, but the one in the back. You know, you guys who are studying. Yeah? Can we have questions from you? No? <laughs> no? Shake of the head? Yes, please. For the question of the design that was uh, never produced, I wonder what was the, the experience you mentioned you could make in Baltimore, but you could make it in uh, New York. Was the constraint? That's one. And secondly, has it even occurred to you to do uh, additive manufacturing, okay, 3D printing, and other techniques? Has other manufacturing processes occurred to you? Um, I, I, just just trying to get to the bottom of what was the biggest constraint of only being produced in Baltimore, but not in New York? Um, I, I, uh, I would, I would uh, say the um, military industry has left New York City, um, except for maybe space exploration. We have some, so we don't we don't necessarily have the technology in New York City anymore. And in places like Baltimore, there's very sophisticated manufacturing that are working for for military organizations. Things like um, 3D printing are. Um, really not dealing with the kind of scale that in the way that things can be made. So I think it's a pariah to think that 3D printing um, is going to replace uh, CNC wire bending or things that can be done very quickly. So. Any other questions? No, no. 
<laughs> Talk about the military complex in Denmark. <laughs> just to so bear in mind that none of us is designers, so. Yeah. Well, that that's okay. <clears throat> uh, so I'm interested in I'm interested in how you increase access to the designs that we're coming Sorry? up. Sorry. So we're designing to so solve social problems and to design with manufacturing within local communities. And how do we increase access and visibility to the people who we're designing for? Um, and I think that comes from a, both a government and level and yeah. a designer level. Yeah, how we create the access. I think one of our finest roles as a design center and, and working in the ecosystem mm -hmm. is actually create, and as I mentioned, experiments on ground. I think that today um, developing uh, solutions, it needs to be co-designed and co-created uh, with the users. And uh, I think that that the best solutions and the best way to create that access is creating some living labs. We have many examples of, of, of labs uh, in Denmark um, that provide that opportunity, if you can say that. But um, I think that it's super, super important to get it out there on the ground. I'm not sure it answered, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's uh, the the plus program that I was mentioning is actually addressing uh, those uh, those challenges uh, as well. When we're having uh, a thousand uh, projects, of course, some of them will be uh, locally and out in the in the in the municipalities and and the local environment. So, so it's all about uh, getting the many out there to. Uh, to, to see what can happen out of these uh, experiments. If I can just add one thing that was mentioned earlier today, how we get design out of, of, of the bubble. And I think that one of our most important roles uh, as a design center is, is actually um, showcasing uh, this stuff. And, and, and our finest role is, is to motivate and engage uh, businesses to do much more experiments and I think it's it's really changing at the moment because because I, I would not say all the buzzwords with the disruption and exponential growth and so forth but I I, I I really sense that there is a change that that more are so open to to what design can do and actually open to explore um, instead of just looking for the solutions uh, immediately so I mean, I would just like to add, and I'll put on my not designer hat, but Parsons hat. Um, <laughs> the, um, th there's a tension between um, doing the work that is needed and immediate um, in the world that's, that's vitally critical, and the, the anticipation of, of um, helping to, to participate in a, in, a, in, a, in a longer arms reach. So. For example, the, the, the spiral loop potato masher was really to open a conversation around um, the, the pending focus around automation and, and the way that things will be made in the future, which will have huge implications on, on labor and displacement, but also open opportunities for companies to be able to make things in a city and not be shipping them and to you know, create all kinds of other supply chains around it. As a, as a faculty working in an institution, it, this is a challenge in working with students. So, um, and I mean, I think Shana could speak to this. Shana does really deep community work. Um, and then to also wear the hat of imagining a completely different future where you're kind of ignoring what things are now and saying, well, what could it be? Um, it's to go back and forth. And if I'm allowed to even pass it on. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to continue. Um, at Design School Calling, we have had uh, more than 600 uh, small and medium-sized companies through a, um, a, a project where we have uh, taught them how to use uh, design. Um, and uh, actually, it's, a very, uh, it's, it's so slow and it demands a lot of resources to work in that way. Uh, and it, has, it, it took us more than six years to get all these companies through uh, uh, that kind of, uh, of course. But I think it is uh, the only way to do it. 
because now we have so many small and medium-sized companies in our neighborhood knowing that design is not only about fashion and uh, beautiful products, but it's also about innovation and uh, new design methods. Um, so I hope that we can do much more of uh, that in the, in, in the future. And we have to help each other with it. Uh, I have also been running a lot of the programs, especially with SMEs. And I think, you know, with the fear of sounding banal, but I think it's, it's, it's really just a matter of, of uh, not trying to, to teach or educate them, but to give them a learning experience. And, and, and um, I, I, it just strikes me how often I meet a company who has never experienced that product in use. I mean, I have, I mean, I really think that is, is surprising and I have so often, you know, gone out with a company and a, a designer say, okay, let's, let's learn about your product and, you know, you have those proud, sorry, in this room, engineers, you know, <laughs> you know going out there and they talk about, you know, what things can do from a te technological point of view and how strong the product is and, um, and, and then they just, you know, go out and see the users. They don't really care, and maybe sometimes they break up the stuff and, 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 and do it, uh, use it for something else. And, and, and I just think that is incredibly <laughs> interesting. So it's just have to push them a little bit. We're running ever so slightly late, but I'm sure we have question two more or three. While you were talking, I was thinking about the language of design. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker, and Rama, I always thought that was an egg masher, not a potato masher. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually in the definition of potato masher. Well, that's so. I I was interested that you limited it to potatoes. As a native New Yorker, I would think it ironic, but I think. But I just think it's interesting. What do we say something is? And then what does somebody think, depending on whether they're Danish or American? So, um, I had a question in regards to um, if you're, if you're a, a design startup, what are the opportunities to engage with the institutes to develop a product, especially how you're giving the example of um, something was not possible to be made in New York, but it was available in another city in Baltimore. That's a lot of the cases for the latest uh, technologies that we want to employ may not be available in North America, but it's kind of common knowledge in Europe. So what are the opportunities to kind of fast track and catch up on this side for innovation from a startup perspective? bringing product to market, where you talked about a lot of the stress. Um, so in, in, in the US, it's a, it's a really challenging prospect. Um, they're, they're, uh, in, in most of the kind of startup is about capitalization and about percentages and about ownership, but there's very little support actually to work. And that was the point I was making through the through, through this sort of small case study. Um, there are uh, great open source communities to be working in, and I think that's a really good place to start. So, you know, looking at the um, at the MakerBot, you know, Brie Pettis's model, but again, it goes back to a model of capitalization of people buying into it. Um, but if you are working um, in the market, it's very challenging to do entrepreneurial work um, uh, from a social perspective is even more challenging, and I think that that's the work which we often try to do at Parsons is actually we do work, and it's one of the reasons I work in education, is to work outside of the market. Um, this becomes even more challenging, and it's, and it's why I think it's uh, the role in many ways, I would like to see more nonprofits and more museums helping to support these other, these, these link throughs because of the, the difficulty. There's a very long history um, of, of that which was tied to industry, so for example, the uh, NASAD, which is a uh, uh, North uh, National Associations of Art and Design. This actually came out of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the 1960s, and they brought together the industrial design programs um, to meet to sort of think of what would be best practice, because the the you know the people of in industry were supporting the Met, and there's and the same people, and I 
you know, don't want to name all of them, but that support all of the institutions, including Parsons, have a stake in what the world becomes. Um, so that's something that I find a big disconnect. But as an entrepreneur, it's very, you know, it's very challenging. I would say the dissemination, getting your work out there as quickly as possible is really important. So um, instead of trying to overly protect its intellectual sort of self, if you're in New York City, you're in one of the greatest cities on the planet, to have people notice what you're doing, and then people will come to you, so. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. I think that um, don't, don't, don't be afraid of, of sharing and, and putting your, your stuff out there. We talk very much at the Danish Science and we have a program also on open source models. I, I think also we actually we do a project together with Bang & Olufsen, who used to be one of the most cl closed companies ever. But they have also realized that they need to you know, share their prototypes and they need to engage with their users and actually ask them to challenge how to to, to uh, make the next products. Uh, I actually had the impression that the whole startup environment and ecosystem in the US was uh, much more vibrant and, and easy because something we really talk about in Denmark is that we, 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 we need more s capital for, for creative businesses. I think that we have come a little, uh, not, not long, but a little step, but, but it seems like you, you have the best conditions if you have some kind of technology or an app involved. <laughs> uh, but I definitely think that, you know, um, to, to support the startups of, of, of products or services, or even as you say, as social solutions, it, it's, there's a potential for improvement. Well, I, 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 and I think I was, sorry, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think I wasn't saying it clearly enough. There is tremendous opportunity in New York City and the United States to support your work and have startups. Um, there is huge, you, you have Wall Street very close by, you have Kickstarter, there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity. I think the challenge is, how do you work on a question of producing in cities for cities? How do you look at smaller supply chains? How do you see design like slow food? This is something that is not as attractive to fund. Um, but if you want to fund your work, you, this is, you know, um, uh, Shapeway sold, I think it was $26 million. Um, so it's, there's opportunity there. Um, and we have these kinds of groups working within Parsons. You can have $100,000 in seed money with a group we're working for as a startup, but it's also very tied to you know, a certain particular kind of commerce. But. Yeah, now it's money. Now I just wanted to add, a, I, I totally agree that it's just about getting your, your, your designer, your, your method out there and, and get some feedback from, from the users and, and, and from there, of course, uh, improve what, whatever you're doing. Um, but I just wanted to, to say that uh, in, in Denmark it's actually quite easy to, to get started or get going with your company. It's the it's the scaling, it's the growth that that is uh, that is a problem uh, in 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 Denmark, uh, and and that's a lot of uh, <laughs> with the, with our political system and and how we we tax and 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 so on. But to get going is quite easy, and you can of course always uh, join Design Denmark and participate <laughs> in in one of our <laughs> mentoring programs and and so on. Commercial. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, it's for everyone on the panel about the relationship between uh, design and production and distance. And so the idea of ecology that you've talked about, um, you talk about the uh, design and production ecology in Denmark. I'm interested in what ecology, the term ecology and what that in, what's carried in that term for you. Um, I think there are a bunch of, um, associations for me that that means uh, a s uh, close in proximity and I'm interested in if that's true for you and then for Rama I think the related term for me is why what's the issue between New York and Baltimore I understand sort of design you know made in uh, what your phrase is made in a city for a city but it seems to me that's still quite a close uh, um, social geography or a kind of a geography of production, the distance between New York and Baltimore is not massive. So I'm interested in what exactly uh, was the delimiting condition for you in Baltimore? Be 
before the panel answers, I just want to alert you to the fact it's five o'clock. So I don't know how we play this uh, because this is a large question. Talking ecologies, talking exchange systems, um, accepting the basis of a capitalist exchange system in our discussion without actually criticizing it in the first place, which I thought from the European binary would probably come up, but doesn't. Um, <laughs> so um, this is a huge question. So I would ask the panel to be brief, and then we'll have, unfortunately, to pass on. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually will invite you to, to come out and have, <laughs> have a drink, because I think it's a it's, it's very big question, and I, I think to, to think about it. So should we create a, an answer together? And, 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 to, and to address your question, um, I have no issues with Baltimore, I have no issues with China. Um, my, my, my question within an institution is what is its role and what is the construction? And I, so I think, can, of, and showing the image of the New Yorker was not the, and I said it's like the Academy Award, it's not about the prestige of it, it's about the possibility that inspires other people to think, you know, maybe I can go to Itza and get a uh, 3D printed bowl of food for $6, which you can now get. Um, it'll print your quinoa, and, and it's right next to the UN, and it's much cheaper. But do we really want to go to a restaurant that is run by robots? Um, and so um, I, I will probably produce it in, in China, the one you saw, and I will probably produce it with a lessee because I need to pay my mortgage. Um, but in terms of, and I'm, so I'm not that idealistic about it, but I do feel that there is a role in certain context and the rarification of the work that it can stand for something else and it can ask questions. So that for me is a, it's a diagram of a possibility and a, and a possible utopia. Rick, very briefly, yeah. Just very short, we, we saw at, um, at the Cuba Hewitt uh, this morning um, a 3D uh, uh, printed, uh, uh, a 3D a robot printer that actually uh, prints a bridge now in um, over a canal in, 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 in Holland. And uh, I mean, imagine the, the resources that you save. Uh, normally, you would uh, uh, produce the, the bridge elements uh, far away, maybe in China, uh, with concrete. And, and they just print it on the spot. So that's, I think that was quite unique. OK, thank you very much. I think we'll take Christina's idea of uh, discussing it afterwards. And so in order to round it off, um, I because uh, Joel so nicely alluded to the, de um, the Danish uh, council, uh, consul, and uh, I want to invite her to come up and close off. So Anna Rigelson, please. how to round a beginning up, that's impossible. But what I can do at five o'clock is to say thank you, big thank you to Parsons and all our friends here for hosting this first event. Big thank you to, to Cooper Hewitt for co-hosting this event and being with us uh, through this day. And of course, a big thank you to our Danish stakeholders who traveled this far and talked this much about, about things which are incredibly um, important. If you New Yorkers have overdosed on all things Denmark, <laughs> which I think you have, you are forgiven. Uh, and I think I will play a parlor game with my Danish friends from now on. When you come to New York and introduce an idea, don't mention Denmark. Introduce the idea. Because what you often do it, when you try to identify with something which is very specific is that you make it me and you. And that is interesting the first three times, but then it's the idea which has to carry. And this I thought about while sitting here and being professionally schizophrenic because I looked at this and listened to this discussion as, as a Dane, of course, but also as an expat and thought, how are we going to seduce you wonderful people? And we are going to seduce you, of course, by finding out that we are exactly the same. And there I will give you um, 
uh, reveal a secret uh, about my, my wonderful country. Denmark is not an aspirational country like the US. Actually, we don't believe in happy ends. We don't believe in heroes. We have a very, very pragmatic way of tackling the world. So when you suddenly see this wave of Danes coming to save the world, it's actually a warning signal <laughs> that everything, including our institutions, is a mess, and you need pragmatic pragmatic Danes to become angels, and from now on, they're only angels together with other angels. Oh, and there you have the happy end. Thank you very much.